an awareness of God, feeling God's looking at you, God's studying you, God's analyzing you, God's expecting from you, God needs you, evoking the fear, thinking of the world and saying, oh my gosh, all these majestic, unbelievable powers and natural forces, and that's just the garments of God. Oh my, imagine God himself, and that evokes the fear, and many, many other ideas. Chapter 43. What is chapter 43 talking about? Chapter 43 is continuing our discussion of fear. Now, we've been discussing fear for two chapters, you might tell me, which is true, though, of course, in those chapters, there was a lot, a lot of information under that very broad word fear. But 41 and 42, almost in a sense, are their own little subsection, developing that whole concept of becoming God's servant with this basic fear. In chapter 43, we're going to progress to higher levels, deeper dimensions, things that require more depth of contemplation, meaning the basic premise of the past two chapters was understand God's looking at you. So in a sense, what that means is I'm looking at the world and I'm saying, here's here's this world, here's there's me. And looking at Hashem's impact on world or on me, that's evoking a fear. And that's true and that's valid. And we've been discussing it for two chapters. And as we keep emphasizing, it's very practical. It's very doable. We relate to this. We understand this. It works. It does. All that is loosely, again, there's a lot of dimensions to it, but loosely, that's called the lower fear. Why is it lower? It's lower because it's coming from world, the physical world. So as we discussed in the beginning of chapter 41, focusing on God, putting aside everything to look at me, or as we discussed at the end of chapter 42, thinking of the awesomeness of this world and recognizing that's just the garments of God. And then the Grand Canyon, the Niagara Falls, uh, rainbow, sunset, mountain range, whatever, that's his garment. Imagine God. So that's also looking at world and from world coming to an awe of God. That's lower fear because it's really coming, thinking about the world. What we're going to say in this chapter is we can also ascend to a higher fear where we're not thinking about the world. We're thinking about how God is within the world how he is vivifying the world and focusing on him, not the world and from the world to him, but think about him, that evokes an even deeper awe, an even deeper relationship with God. So looking inside chapter 43, we are starting a new chapter, always so exciting. Behine, behold, al yira tata zu. What we've been discussing in the past two chapters, that's called yira tata. That's a lower fear in very broad strokes. Our first relationship to God is this basic fear. I say it's our first relationship, though somebody could change the order up. But for most people, the most natural human relationship with God is fear. Is a sense of his power, is a sense of his presence, is a sense of my smallness and his bigness and nullification to him. Now, within that, of course, there's hundreds of levels. Is it like, whoa, I'm scared. I don't want to get in trouble. Is it like, whoa, I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to sin and give my energy to the enemy. There's higher and higher levels within this basic awareness of God, which evokes a nullification of fear and awe. And for most people, that's the first thing that happens in their relationship with God. It's the most natural thing. It's the easiest thing. We all have this knee jerk response. If God forbid something bad happens and you know, you feel this, oh, thank God it didn't happen to me or want to make sure I'm protected. Very, very natural response is fear of God. Higher than that, again, still in very basic relationships is love of God, where it's a little for some people, it's a little bit of a stretch. For some people, it's supernatural. I think generationally, we're in a generation where this love is much more natural than it used to be, because that's sort of the energy of our generation. We're so, so close to the redemption. God's presence is so strong. It's so easy to feel love. Obviously, you could have started off 30 years ago feeling love, and now you also feel love, but your love, even though it could still be the very basic love, but it's coming from a deeper and deeper and more and more inner dimension of truly being aware of God, being aware of his love for you, being aware of his blessings in your life, being aware of his bounty, of his beneficence, of his kindness, of his generosity. All of that evokes love. When you feel loved, you love. When you feel how much God loves you, you naturally love him, as we will discuss soon. Not in this chapter, but coming soon. We discuss that if you're aware that someone loves you, you naturally love them. 
So our, our awareness of God's love for us as we look at our life and see the presence of God and see his kindnesses and compassion and miracles, I feel love. The more I feel love, the more I naturally love. So loving God is also a pretty natural phenomenon. The difference between fear and love for most people, again, some people are different, especially in our generation. Some people go first to love. But for most people, fear, you don't have to like think about anything. You don't have to contemplate. You don't have to focus. You don't have to do any like mental work or emotional work. Things happen in your life and you have a fear of God. You have a sense of vulnerability, a sense of fear. For love, there's a bit more focus of like re recognizing God's goodness recognizing God's kindness, recognizing how God is taking such care of you, recognizing how much God loves you. So there is some awareness that you might not have organically, and maybe you need to study some Tanya or something like that to be focused, notice, mark all the myriads of blessings in your life. But again, it's something that once you understand the concept, it's very natural. We can all do it. You don't have to be on this high, high spiritual level. We can all look at our life, see the blessings in our life, be grateful to God for the blessings in our life and feel his love for us as expressed in his care, his concern, his blessings. And as I feel his love, I love. So those two relationships to God, basic fear and with a little bit of awareness, basic love are really very natural to the human. And then comes a lot of work to attain a much higher love and an even higher awe. Now in this chapter, we're focusing on the fears. We're gonna start with a basic fear that we've been discussing for two chapters. And then we're gonna discuss the very, very, very high love, high, sorry, I'm sorry, the very high fear, which as we said, comes not from focusing on what I see in this world, but what I don't see. God's energy that's with in the world about this basic love which in the aramaic is called yura tata zu this one shehi lakim is vice his birth this is a tool this fear this awe of god on on a very basic level is the tool to serve him to keep the commandments in both dimensions when we first speak about this concept in chapter four of tanya we separate and say, fear is to keep me from the wrong. Love is to inspire me to do more good. Because fear, I don't want to harm the relationship or I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to have problems. So I'm keeping away from what I shouldn't do. And love means I want a connection. I want a relationship. I want to be fused. And that motivates me to do because every act of doing is another point of fusion between me and God. But we can really look at both love and fear as sort of like foundational of both. If you really love God, you really not only want to do everything he wants, you want to keep away from everything he doesn't want because I really love you. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to give you pain. I don't want to do anything against you. And those 365 prohibitions and the thousands and thousands and thousands of subsidiary branches that the, the rabbis enacted from them, if I do any one of them, I'm giving the one I love ultimately God, pain, I'm separating from him, I'm harming him. So I really love God, I wouldn't wanna do that anyway. Conversely, as we're saying here, fear is foundational, not only to keeping away from what you shouldn't do, it's also foundational to inspire you to do what you have to do. Now we learned this for the first time in chapter 41, right? Until chapter 41, Seemed like love is to do, fear is to keep away. And if you ask anyone who studied the first 40 chapters of Tiny and didn't get past that, of course they would say the most foundational thing is love. But starting chapter 41, we said, actually, fear is. And actually, this fear, which means a sense of God's presence that I'm nullified to, that nullification to God, of course, keeps me from doing anything he doesn't allow, but it also is a nullification that inspires me to do everything he wants me to do. So that's why the Rebbe is saying here, this basic fear, again, as I said, hundreds of levels within this basic fear. But the fear we've been discussing for two chapters, 41 and 42, which we call this basic fear, an awareness of God that inspires me to be nullified, to be subservient, to be in awe, to feel his presence, that engenders me to serve him. Therefore, I serve. Therefore, I study Torah and keep its commandments. 
everything God says to do and everything that God says to not do and all of the rabbinicals and all of the customs, everything is coming from this basic awe of God, my foundational fear. Amru, so the sages said, and we're going to take this phrase. This is in Ethics of the Fathers, Perkevo. And there's actually two parts to this phrase. We're using one part here in terms of the lower fear, and then we'll use the other part in terms of the upper fear. But right now we're in the lower fear. So what did the sages say? Im ein yira, ein chachma. If there's no fear, there is no wisdom. What they mean by that is if there is no fear, if you do not have this basic fear, this yira tata, this lower fear, an awareness of God, feeling God's looking at you, God's studying you, God's analyzing you, God's expecting from you, God needs you, evoking the fear, thinking of the world and saying, oh my gosh, all these majestic, unbelievable powers and natural forces, and that's just the garments of God. Oh my, imagine God himself, and that evokes the fear, and many, many other ideas. All of that, if you don't have this, in Chachma, you don't have the ultimate wisdom of Torah mitzvahs. The ultimate wisdom is Torah. is expressed in the commandments and the mitzvahs. So in, in Yira, in Chachma, if there's no fear, there's no wisdom. If you don't have this fear, what in the world is going to get you to serve God? Meaning, obviously, some service is maybe cultural, how you were raised. But there's a lot that God demands that you need some motivation to do it. <laughs> it might not be as convenient. It might not be as natural. It might be more expensive. It might take time. So ultimately, you need something to to push you to do it. So the sages are saying, you know what pushes you? This basic relationship with God, this basic fear, this basic, I was in the beginning of chapter 41. He's looking at me. He needs me. He's relying on me. He's analyzing me. If you just think these thoughts, it's like, ooh, I better get moving. I better live up to his trust and faith and need for me. I better do what I'm in this world to do, which is, which is what he's waiting for. So in, in Yira, in Chachma, if we don't have this lower fear, we'll never ascend to have the wisdom of Torah and her commandments. That's why this is supporting what the Rebbe just said, that fear is a foundation, not only of holding back from the prohibitions, but actually of fulfilling all of the commandments. Now within fear, we have this lower dimension and we have this upper dimension. When a person is thinking about the greatness of God, that he fills all the world, and from heaven to earth is what would be the distance of 500 years, and from firmament to firmament, from planet to planet, from level to level of the heavens, how the lower levels, the lowest levels of the highest of these levels of God's angels that we call chayos hakodesh, as we refer to in our prayers, in the morning prayers, are much higher than anything that goes below them in terms of serving God. And we can talk about the progression of all the world. Higher and higher and higher. We're talking about a lot of high stuff. A lot of holy stuff. We're talking about all this supernal stuff. I don't know if you were following everything I was saying. I was I was just rattling off a list of a lot of things. But we're talking about things in this physical world. We're talking about from earth to above, physically and spiritually, and all the rikim, which are the translates heavens or firmaments, all these spiritual dimensions. We're talking about angels. We're talking about the spiritual worlds. And you know what? All of that. Everything I just listed, and of course, many, many, many other things within those broad areas. What you get from thinking about those things, that's called a lower fear. That's called a more superficial fear. Why? I'm talking about really high stuff here. I'm thinking about the angels. I'm thinking about the Rakim, the firmaments of heaven. I'm thinking about the spiritual world, the Tzilas, Bria, Yitzira. See, I'm talking about very celestial concepts. I'm not talking about things you're, you're touching with your hand. I'm not talking about things that have molecules or cells or physicality. I'm talking about very spiritual things. Rabbi says, I know. I just told you them. And they're all still going to evoke a year of tata. Why? Well, the Rebbe says, since 
shenimshechas mehaolam. Everything you're thinking about, even though it's not a product of physicality, but it's still a product of creation. If I think of Olam Hatzilus, highest world from the four worlds of our spiritual galaxies, that's creation. If I think of the highest angels, that's also creation. If I think of the distance from spiritual dimension to spiritual dimension, that's also creation. So I'm thinking of very holy, celestial, sublime, supernal, spiritual entities. It's all creation. So any time I think about creation and from my offer creation, it evokes a fear of God, that's yiratata. That's the lower fear. Meaning what the Rebbe is clarifying here is, I could think, okay, lower fear. I understand if I contemplate the Niagara Falls and that gives me a fear of God, which is a very, very good, wonderful thing. That's lower because it's, you know, Niagara Falls. It's a physical phenomenon. If I think of the Rocky Mountains, if I think of a sunset, if I think of a thunderstorm, if you think of all of these things of our natural world, and I'm like, wow, that fills me with an awe of God. Okay, I get that's lower fear because I'm thinking of physicality. If I think of God watching me and needing me and analyzing me, that evokes a fear. That evokes a lower fear. Okay, I'm also a piece of physicality. But when I think of angels, when I think of supernal worlds, atzilos, beyond, and I think about them and I'm full of an awe of God because, oh my, look at all of this. Why is it a lower fear? And the Rebbe says, because you're still stuck on creation. Not just physicality is creation. Elam Hazad Gashmi, planet Earth. Every angel is creation. Every spiritual dimension is creation. Everything besides God himself is creation. So even though we're talking about spiritual, spiritual, spiritual levels and maybe higher levels, and I didn't take the time to really explain much because it's more bringing out a point. You don't need to understand all the details. You just have to get the point. The highest spiritual dimension is not creator. It's creation. So you're still stuck on creation. Okay, I'm not thinking about physicality. I'm not thinking about the solar system. I'm not thinking about grass and trees and flowers and animals and fish and fauna. I'm thinking about angels and spiritual dimensions. True, but you're still thinking about creation. And the Rebbe says, as long as you're thinking about creation, what is evoked from those thoughts is a lower fear. Why lower? Because it's evoked by creation. Now, when we're saying it's a lower fear, I wanna clarify. We don't mean don't do it. We just spent two chapters, and those are two of the longest chapters in Lakutei Amarim, in the 53 chapters. Obviously, we want you to do it. Again, we spent two chapters. I think they probably are the two longest chapters of the 53 chapters of Lakutei Amarim, Tanya. We want you to create this lower fear. We're just saying it happens to be something higher. So the fact that we're saying, ah, you think about the angels, that's lower fear. You think about the spiritual dimensions, that's lower fear. You think about planet Atzilus, that's lower fear. It doesn't mean don't do it. We want you to do it. And obviously, if you're thinking about high celestial supernal things, it's evoking a very strong awe of God. So it's a very good thing to think about. So none of this is supposed to knock those thoughts. We're just clarifying that you shouldn't think, well, since I'm thinking about angels or spiritual dimensions, obviously this is the higher fear I'm accessing because I'm thinking about high spiritual realities. And there says no, because you're still thinking about creation. So how do I get a upper fear? You think about creator. Think about creator. That's going to evoke the higher fear. Thinking about creation, even the most spiritual creation, even the most sublime creation, creation is higher and higher and higher and higher. There are many levels higher than Atsilos that Tanya generally does not discuss. Higher and higher and higher and higher. It's great, it's high, it's awesome. It will create a very powerful lower fear. You want upper fear as well. I mean, we definitely want you to have the lower fear, but you want upper fear as well. Now start thinking about creator. Beyond creation, think about creator. Now a person could say, why in the world would I need to think about the angels to evoke the fear of God when I think of Niagara Falls or the Rocky Mountains or a beautiful day, it also evokes a fear of God. I don't have to think about the angels, but the more we think, and really in a sense, the higher we're thinking about, the more fleshed out and fully developed does this fear become. So I said, we don't have to learn Tanya to have a basic fear of God. You really don't. You really don't. 
I'm sure most of you had a fear of God as long as you were aware of yourself and your reality. Before you learned any Tyra, you probably had a natural fear of God. Or once you reached a certain age, you probably had a natural fear of God. You don't have to study to have that. So then why bother? Why did we spend two chapters of Tanya talking about developing something I can have without it? Because the more I study and think about it and contemplate and make it strong in my mind and my vision, the stronger and more powerful and more full-fledged that fear becomes. It's not only evoked in moments of crisis or danger. It's something natural to my psyche, something I think about, I'm in living in sync with, and impacts my actions. So when the sages say, I mean, you're in Chachma, there's no fear of God. There's no wisdom of Torah mitzvahs. On one hand, well, you all have this natural fear and that's going to lead to Torah mitzvahs. And on the other hand, the more you develop this natural fear through thinking thoughts as were advised in the past two chapters of Tanya, the more full and powerful and all encompassing this fear become, this awe of God, this nullification to God, want to just be subsumed in God, totally nullified to him, the more it's going to affect you and lead you to complete service, a life of Torah mitzvah. So again, I just wanted to say, we're not saying don't do this. We're just saying, and there's something even higher. Thank uh, first you so thing, much. Even though I'm thinking about the angels, even though I'm thinking about the high supernal worlds, it's still coming from creation. Shehem levushim. The highest creations are only God's garments. The world of Atsilas, the world of being, is a lofty, sublime garment of God. The highest angels, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, are sublime garments of God. It's not God, it's his garments. So as long as what we are focusing on is a garment, creates an awe that's viewed as lower because it's not it's coming from the lower dimension not god but his garments his creation so it's the garments shall hamelach of the king remember we discussed this at length at the end of chapter 42 as we look at creation it's like the royal robe the ceremonial robes and we said we don't see the body of the king we see his robes and that's enough to evoke this awe so Everything, including the world of being, the highest angels, beautiful, beautiful, refined, celestial garments of the king, royal robes, but not the king, not God, only his garments. So what's God doing in those garments? He's hiding himself. He's concealing himself. He's hiding. He's engarbed in them. He's concealed by them. There's an obstruction between him and me, and that's called creation. He's within them to vitalize them, to give them life, to give them existence. So they shouldn't exist. If he, for one second, stopped, they wouldn't be. Nothing would be. So if so, a person could say, so why? Do we spend so much time, as we did spend two chapters, focusing on developing this awe when we're saying, oh, well, you're not thinking about God. You're thinking about his garments. It's not God. It's just his garments. But this higher awe. So why did I focus on that for two chapters? Because it's a very good tool. That's why I'm in this world. I am in this world to serve God. I am in this world to study Torah, do mitzvahs, pray, give charity, be a good person, a kind person, a compassionate person. I'm in this world to make this world God's home. So if I am focusing on creation, including these highest, most spiritual creation, and that evokes in me the awe, that leads me to a life of service, that's really good. That's exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. So we are really happy you're doing it. We want you to do it. If you're not doing it, it's a big problem. We learned chapter 41 and chapter 42. And now we want to say, not but, but and. And there's something higher that's also good to access. Is it a practical tool to get me to serve? No, that was the basic awe. It's something more refined than that. But let's read about the higher awe. Yira Boishas. It's what we call sometimes, there's three names we're giving it for here. Yira Ila'a a supernal awe in contrast to yiratata, the lower awe. We also call it yira boishas, 
in awe, which is an embarrassment. Now, just as fear is a trigger word in our society, which I truly was thinking of, and I probably picked up Figa High's brainwaves, embarrassment is also. Embarrassment doesn't sound good, doesn't sound positive, but it depends in what context. So when we say a fear, a awe, that's an embarrassment, we mean you're embarrassed to sin. Why am I embarrassed to sin? Well, within being embarrassed to sin, there's many levels. You can be embarrassed to sin because you're aware of God's presence. You remember we referenced this in earlier chapters that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, remember we discussed this last chapter? How Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, when, he, when his students wanted to be blessed before he passed away, and he was the leader of his generation who saved Judaism forever, and he said, fear God like you fear a person. And they're like, huh? That's the blessing of the great sage who saved all Judaism, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai? He said, well, if someone's around, you're not going to sin. <laughs> you know, you'd be embarrassed. You don't want him seeing you like that. Is God not always around? So there is a certain level of embarrassment, which is embarrassment to sin, because I'm very, very conscious of God's presence. God's presence is very real to me. It's not theoretical. It's not something I pull out of my hat when I'm standing and praying, or even when I'm studying Torah. It's, it's an aspect of my life. He's always watching. I'm sure you have all had this experience. Maybe you were talking a little sharply to your child and suddenly you notice someone or they're coming closer and you just change your tone or change your words. Why? You don't want to look like that in front of another person. God's always here. So that's one level of embarrassment. But there's also a much deeper concept, which is when a person recognizes that any time a person sins, in essence, what they're doing is taking God's energy and putting it, as Alta Rebbe told us a number of chapters ago, taking the face of the king and pushing it down in a toilet full of vomit. That's a pretty horrific image. It says, that's what happens when you sin. Because God is giving you his most inner energies. Every one of us constantly is receiving Hevel Ha'elion, the supernal breath, the breath from God himself, which is much deeper than what all creation exists on. Because all of creation, as we've probably mentioned many times, exists by virtue of God's speech, of God's words. With 10 ma'amarot, with 10 creative utterances, God created heaven and earth, and he's been saying those statements ever since. 5,784 years and counting. He keeps saying creation into being. So all of creation is God's words, but my soul is from God's breath. My soul is actually a piece of God, and it's constantly being vivified, not by word, by breath, which is much deeper, much, much more inward. We can talk and talk and talk and talk, and often we do, but we can't keep blowing up those balloons. We'll run out of breath because breath comes from a much deeper place. So my soul is constantly getting the breath of God, as is yours, as is every Jew's soul. And that's why we are such an enticing target for evil. Meaning, of course, we all know we have something called an evil inclination, that personal angel agent sent to get us to sin. And really, the forces of evil are always targeting Jews. They're always trying to get us to sin. A non-Jew doesn't have an evil inclination, does not. The forces of evil do not deliberately target non-Jews to get them to sin. Why? Well, it's our problem that we, God's chosen people, have an evil inclination and the nations of the world don't. It's very simple. If the forces of evil got a non-Jew to sin, they wouldn't be gaining so much. There's not so much revenue. There's not so much profit. Why bother? Obviously, everything evil done in this world profits the powers of evil. But there's not that much profit you can make from a non-Jew's action. Jew? Ooh. Now you're getting the richest, the most powerful, the most potent force. You're getting the breath of God himself. I mean, just imagine if, I don't know, a kidnapper. Is he going to target the child of a... I'm saying someone who's kidnapping to ransom to make money. Is he going to target the child of some pauper? What could the pauper give him anyway? He's going to go for the multimillionaire, the multibillionaire. That's where he's going to rake it in. So the forces of evil 
are targeting each and every Jew because that's where they rake it in because we have this enormous, intimate power from God, his very breath. And that's why sinning is embarrassing. It's embarrassing to sin because when I sin, I'm taking God. I'm harming God. He gave me his very breath and that's what the forces of evil have sucked in, usurped, kidnapped, sabotaged, hijacked. That's why they targeted me. That's my wealth. And they got me. I stumbled. I fell on my face. I sinned. And for the duration of sin, all of that breath of God is being controlled by, taken in by the forces of evil. And that's why they were targeting me. So they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger as I sin from my transgressions. That's the embarrassment. The embarrassment of sin is I'm harming God. I'm taking God's most inner energy and now it's the food of evil. Every time a Jew sins, evil gets stronger. Every time a Jew resists, evil gets weaker. It's embarrassing to sin when I realize how I'm directly, not just going against God's will, which is embarrassing, based on a verse, Yaakov Chevel Nachalaso. Yaakov is a rope of his inheritance, that it's like there's this rope connecting my soul and God. And when I go down, so does he. When I'm pulling on the bottom of the rope, the top of the rope follows. That's embarrassing. It's horrific to think when I do something wrong, I'm forcing God to be in the dimension of evil. But that's actually exactly what happens every time I do something wrong. So the more I think about this, the more sinning is a tragedy and an embarrassment. And that embarrassment, not again on the simple level embarrassed because he's watching and I'm going against him, but on this much deeper level, embarrassment to feel how much I'm harming God. And that awe of the embarrassment of harming God is a very, very deep and powerful power to stay very aligned with him. So that's the second name for this upper awe, either Yira Ila'a, the supernal awe, because it's coming from an awareness of God, Yira Burchas, and all which is coming from this embarrassment, again, coming from a recognition of God and how God is harmed by my transgressions. As I said, the author Rebbe said, you're taking the face of the king, God's very essence and being, and you're squashing it down in this toilet of vomit. That's what's happening when you sin. That's embarrassing. Now we have a third title, a third name for this, Fiyir Pnimis. It's an inner awe. Because again, we said before, if you remember, conversely, we had Yira Tata, the lower awe, Yira Ila'a, the higher awe. We called it Yira Chitsoinis, a more external awe coming from the externalities, God's garments. Well, this is Yira Pnimis, an inner awe, because we're not getting stuck on the garments. We're thinking about God inside those garments. We're not going for the externals. We're not going for the outside. We're not going for the superficial, what the eye sees. We're going for what's vivifying all of that. We're going for the inner core. We're going for God. And that's why this is called the year pnimis, coming from those inner dimension. Your pnimis means an inner awe, coming from the inner dimension, an awareness of God within all the wrapping paper, within all the garments. So why are we calling this an inner awe? Because it's elicited by our focus on the inner workings, not the garments, not creation, including the most supernal sublime creation, but God's energy within creation. I'm not thinking about creation. I'm thinking about the creator within. That's what's evoking this relationship. And that's a pnimi look. It's not what's on the outside. It's what the eye cannot see. The inner dimension, focusing on the inner dimension, God within the wrappings, evokes an inner awe. Allah amru. So on this type of relationship to God, they, the sages said, if there's no wisdom, there's no awe. Meaning, if you remember, we said before, this is uh, a famous 
quotation from Ethics of the Fathers from Pirkei Avos, where we say things like, if there's no awe, there's no wisdom. If there's no wisdom, there's no awe. And you're like, well, which am I supposed to do first? You know, come on. If I don't have awe, I can't have wisdom. But if I don't have wisdom, I can't have awe. So therefore, I can't have anything. So what's going on here? Now, the Alter Rebbe explains this, which is actually four such stanzas in this quotation from Ethics of Father. In each stanza, in each line, he gives the same concept. We're talking about two levels of whatever we're talking about. So here, if you don't have the lower awe, you can never come to service of God, to Torah mitzvahs. Conversely, if you don't have this wisdom, if you don't have this Torah mitzvahs, if you don't have the knowledge of God that comes from Torah, you could never access this relationship, this higher awe of God. Because you could only get this through Torah that has taught you about him. Meaning, the basic awe, I said, you don't need to be a scholar. You don't even have to open up any book. A human being naturally has an awe of God. It's like how we're wired. And plenty of things in the world reinforce it. So you don't need to learn and study and contemplate and meditate to start having this relationship. Now, of course, we spend two chapters of Tanya, two long chapters of Tanya, discussing how you can develop this because there's higher and higher levels within this basic awe. There's levels that it's not just higher, it's more encompassing. So you don't just feel this in moments of crisis, but you're constantly living a life of awe of God. That's what we spent two chapters developing. But the basic awe of God, you don't need to open up a book to feel. So if you don't have this as a foundation, in Chokma, you can't proceed. What's going to motivate you to do Torah mitzvahs? Conversely, if you don't have Torah mitzvahs, if you don't have Torah, if you don't have God's will and wisdom, in Yira, you cannot access this higher dimension of awe of God because it's coming from your awareness of God himself, not of the garments. You don't need to be schooled and studied to be aware of the garments of God, but to get to God within his garments, for that you need Torah. For that you really need Hasidus. Because as you learn Hasidus, as we are of course learning in the Tanya, the more we learn Tanya, the more God is real. I can say for myself personally that when I first began studying Tanya a few years ago, <laughs> that was to me the greatest shift. Maybe it's a, it's a very simplistic concept, but it, I just really felt God's reality. God's so real. He is. You know, of course, like God always believed and led an observant life and etc. But as I studied Tanya, it's not just abstract, remote. There's this big God out there and you got to listen to him, of course. And he's a wonderful God, a loving God, a powerful God. No, no, no. Suddenly he's right here. Suddenly he's so real. That's what I felt. That was my Tanya shift. So in Ein Chachma in Yira, if you're not studying the wisdom of God, Taira, you can't get to this awe because this all comes from your awareness, not of the garments, but of the God within the garments that you can't see. So how am I seeing it? Through Taira. Through Taira, I see the unseeable. I see God himself. So the more I immerse myself in Taira, the more real God is, the more vibrant in my whole being God is, the more I naturally can access this upper, higher, more intimate awe of God.